Welcome back to The Gospel is Gold. I'm Josh McCreary, and we want to open God's Word again today and talk about being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, God gives a perfect plan how we can go to war with the devil and be successful. You know, in the United States, we have a saying in our army, be all that you can be in the army. So today, we want to talk about from God's Word how we can be all that we can be in God's army. I pray that you'll stay tuned as we talk about this in just a moment. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And now, Josh McCrary, the gospel is gold. The preacher met the man in the back of the church building and he said to him, he said, you know, why don't you become a member of the Lord's army? The man looked at the preacher and he said, oh, I've, I've been in the Lord's army for many years. The preacher said, well, how come you only come to church on Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter? And the man said to the preacher, he said, I'm in the Lord's secret service. <laughs> you know, that's actually a sad thing when you think about it. Because there is no secret service in Christianity. There are no Christians anonymous. You see, we have a responsibility to fight and be strong in God's army. In the introduction of this lesson, I want us to talk about this principle of how God wants us to be strong. You'll find in there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, the Bible says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, and be strong. You know, it's interesting when we talk about being strong, it's usually associated with, with a man. Because men are usually fairly strong. And God says, quit like men. What that means is don't be a quitter, but when you do quit, you go out with your boots on. So in Christianity today, how many of us could honestly say that we were fighting like men? Now, you can be a woman and still be strong. You can still put up a fight like a strong man in the army of God. Have you done that today? I want to give you several principles as we begin this study today, talking about being strong in the introduction of this lesson. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul is writing to Timothy and he said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we want to be strong in it. We, we don't want to be weak in God's grace. <laughs> well, how do we do that? He continues and he said, the things that which thou hast learned, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know what that tells me in that verse? That if I'm not teaching others in some way or some form, that I'm not being faithful. I've got to be actively involved in the teaching of the gospel somehow or some way. Some people do it behind the scenes. Some people do it in front of the scenes. But whatever the case may be, I've got to be actively involved in the service of the Lord at some point in my life. He continues, and he said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what we want today. We want to be good soldiers for God. You know, we don't want to be a weak soldier or a bad soldier. So these are the principles that we want to talk about today. What is it that makes a strong soldier in the kingdom of God? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 John also writes about this idea of being strong. And he said, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You see, if the word of God does not abide in me, I cannot be strong. And God wants me and you to be strong soldiers, faithful soldiers in His kingdom today. I want you to think about something, and, and if you have your Bibles, I pray that you'll open them to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, and this will be our text. But while you're turning there, I want you to think about something just for a minute. And if you'll Google what a Roman sword looked like in the first century, you'll find that it's actually fairly short. It's only about 36 or 32 inches long, and uh, it, it has two edges. And it's not really heavy as compared to maybe like a broadsword or a longsword. The Vikings were, were pretty much known for heavy war instruments. But the Romans learned something from the Spartans. 
they learned that face-to-face -face combat was one of the most effective ways to overcome your enemy. It was either long distance with arrows or face-to-face -face with a short sword. Now you picture this Roman sword, it's only about 36 inches long, and they could swing it very quickly. And what the Romans would do is they would lock their shields together and they would push with their shields and stab with the sword. And they would push with their shields and stab with the sword. And in essence, they would just mow over the enemy. Now this is pretty important when you talk about this Christian armor that we find in Ephesians chapter 6. Because in verse 17, he said, Take unto you the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So that sword that we are pictured as having in a Christian war is the Word of God. The question is, how effective is my sword? You know, we don't want to show up in battle uh, and pull a butter knife out of our pockets. You know, what if we've got everything that we need in the Christian armor, but then all of a sudden we're standing in a war line, ready to go to war, and, and everybody has a, their sword and we pull out this little short dagger. And my fellow soldiers are going to look at me and they're going to say, look, you need to go home. You're more than just a liability right now. Well, think about this as we talk about the Christian armor in Ephesians chapter 6. Look there in verse 10, if you will. We'll notice about eight verses. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, all of this is the exact equipment that we need to go to war against the devil. And I want to tell you today, friend, it is a war. In fact, he said, we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the spiritual wickedness in high places, against the principalities, the rulers of darkness of this world. You see, it is a battle. And I want to encourage you today to be a good fighter. And don't just turn over and let the devil take over your life. I want to give you several characteristics today that make a good soldier in God's kingdom. Number one, when he realizes his confrontation... You see, many people just go through life and, you know, we talk about Duke Blue Devils. We talk about deviled eggs. We talk about devil's food cake. And, and I don't want to say that those are bad because I, I like all of those. <laughs> but we don't want to go through life thinking that the devil is a joke. He's not a joke. He is real, friend, and there is a real confrontation with him. The Bible says that he is as a roaring lion seeking whoever he will devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. We've got to stand against Him. And I, I want to focus on this confrontation in the word against in your text. Because in your text in Ephesians 6, He said that you will stand against the wiles of the devil. He said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we've got to do something to have a confrontation with the devil. I'm reminded of a story a man told one time. He said uh, in the story that the devil appeared at church service out of nowhere, just a big cloud of smoke, and all of a sudden the devil was there. And everyone was running. They, said they were so scared. They couldn't believe how terrible he looked. But everyone ran away except for one man. He came to the front row and he sat next to the devil, and the devil looked at him and said, You mean to tell me you're not afraid of me? The man looked the devil right in the face and he said, I've been married to your sister for 40 years. Of course I'm not, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> well, I want to tell you today, friend, that I don't want to be afraid of the devil either. And although he may not directly appear in front of me, I cannot see where he's at. But I want to tell you this, I want to put up a fight today, don't you? 
Why don't we make a challenge today to say, yes, I'm going to confront the devil. Because God says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We want to make that devil go away. We've got to have the right confrontation. I want to give you three things that we stand against today. The first one is we stand against false doctrines. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 that there are many unruly and vain talkers, especially those of the circumcision, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. He says, Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You see, we've got to make a stand. <laughs> you know, we can't just say, oh, well, you know, uh, I know there's a lot of false doctrine in my local congregation where I'm at, but I'll just keep attending there, and, you know, maybe it'll go away eventually. Well, we may have to confront some things sometimes. It's not always pleasant. Maybe it shouldn't always be the first action that we take. But sometimes we just have to call sin for what it is. We've got to call false doctrine for what it is. God expects us to put up a fight sometimes. That doesn't mean dividing the brotherhood. It doesn't mean uh, go around pointing out people's faults. What it means is if we hear false doctrine being taught, we need to question it and we need to say, wait a minute. We don't want to be mean or rude, but we want to understand why you're teaching this. We may have to stand against it. You know, Paul said that he spoke the truth in love. We could have all the truth in the world and not have love and we wouldn't do a bit of good. We could have all the love in the world and not have truth and we wouldn't do a bit of good. We've got to stand against false doctrine and we've got to do it in a loving way. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 17 that we also stand against evil. So when we war against the devil, we stand against false doctrine. We stand against evil. And the Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a battle against the flesh and the soul. It's been going on since the Garden of Eden. You see, when man gave in to the flesh, in a way, he sort of sacrificed his soul, didn't he? God said, the moment you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You know, he died in two ways that day. He died physically and he died spiritually. In fact, the text says, dying thou shalt die. And today, death comes upon all of us physically because of that result. But thankfully, spiritually, God gave us a way to defeat the devil. So we stand against evil. We stand against false doctrine. I want to give you one more. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12 and you look at verse 4, you'll notice that we also stand against sin. We don't want to allow sin to, to overtake us. All of us are going to sin from time to time, but how many of us could honestly say that we resist sin? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4 that you have not resisted unto blood in striving against sin. There's your word against. You and I have a responsibility to stand up against sin. To say, no, I want to fight. <laughs> I don't want this thing to take over my life. And I want to stand against the devil. So, number one, the first thing I see that makes a good soldier is when he understands his confrontation. But he also understands, number two, the complication. You know, this is not easy. It's very difficult. And, you know, we're not just going to haphazardly, if you will, serve God. The more I study the Bible, the more I realize the importance of giving God everything we've got. You know, the first great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And I believe that if I would have understood that on the front end, that I, I probably would have been better off as a new Christian. But thankfully, you know, we grow, we progress, and, and I hope and pray that I do that. I hope and pray that you do that, that you put God first. That's our main responsibility as a Christian. It's complicated. And this soldier, he understands, number two, the complication. It's interesting, if you look at your text in Ephesians 6, 
uh, verses 10 through 18, he mentions the word stand multiple times. In fact, in verse 10, he said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. A little bit later, he says in your text, he said, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Then in the very next passage, he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So four times, he mentions in those passages the importance of the, the complication it is to stand for God. Somebody said one time, If we stand for nothing, we'll fall for everything. And that is very, very true. There were two people arguing, and one of them says to the other, Will you not meet me in the middle? <laughs> and the other one answered and said, Yes, I'll meet you in the middle when you admit that you were wrong. <laughs> well, you know, confrontations are not all bad, although that one was bad. You know, we want to focus on this word, uh, stand, just for a minute. And I, I want us to go to James chapter 4. And I want to show you how the word withstand in your text is translated a little bit differently. And in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, James is writing about how we can fight the devil. Okay? And he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. So focus on that word resist just for a minute. Resist the devil. It's the same word translated withstand in your text when, when Ephesians 6, he said that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. So resisting and withstanding are the same. But you know, it's complicated. The complication is always there. I want to give you some scriptures that talk about standing. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have access by grace uh, wherein you stand. So we stand in God's grace. We move a little bit forward, and you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2, and he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, by which also you are saved, wherein you stand. So we stand in God's grace, we stand in the gospel, and also in Galatians chapter 5, you're going to find that we stand in freedom. The Bible calls it liberty. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, he said, Stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. So we stand in the gospel, we stand in God's grace, we stand in God's freedom. I'm reminded of uh, Matt Labram. You can look him up on Google. And uh, what he did was very outstanding. Uh, he was a football coach, and uh, he suspended all the players on his team. He called them in to the locker room one night after they had lost a game, and uh, he gathered them all together, and he, he said something very particular. Uh, he said, I want all of you to turn in your jerseys and turn in your equipment because no one is going to play on this football team until you earn the right to play. Here's what he said in an interview. They asked him why he did this. He said, we felt like we needed to make a stand. He had learned of his football players. They were uh, doing things like bullying people. They had bad grades. Some of them were skipping school. You know, all, all he, he, he noticed all these things that were going on in his players' lives, and he said, these players have got to earn the right to play football. Well, he made a stand. He did the right thing, and that's what making a stand is. So when we stand against the devil, there's a confrontation. There's also a complication. It is never easy to do the right thing, is it? I'll give you this one in Colossians chapter 4, and verse 12. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, he salutes you, and always laboring fervent for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. So is it easy to stand in God's will? It's not. Is it easy to stand in the gospel? Is it easy to stand in God's grace? It is not. But all of us are willing to do it. Let me give you one more, and I want to move to Revelation chapter 20. 
And I want to give you the end result of this. We stand in God's grace. We stand in the gospel. We stand in God's will because one day we will all stand before God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, uh, the, small, the, the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You see, they all stood before God in the judgment day. You know, I'm reminded in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he said, Stand fast and hold the traditions which you have received of us. We've got to realize that one day we will meet God in judgment. We will stand there, and we will face Him. So this good soldier, number one, he, he noticed his, his confrontation, his complication. I want to move on to number three, uh, that he also uh, notices that there is a concentration. You know, I want to focus on this word fight just for a minute. Because he, he focuses on fighting against the devil. And he said uh, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not. We do not fight against flesh and blood. But against principality, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. We've got to concentrate on our fight. A professor brought in coffee to his students at college. And he brought in four different kinds of glasses. He brought in uh, porcelain. He brought in glass, crystal, and plastic. And he was, go he was doing a survey in his own mind. He, he didn't tell anybody what was going on. And he watched the students as they got coffee. And he noticed that they fixed their coffee. And uh, all the students picked up first the porcelain, the glass, and the crystal. And all the plastic cups were left. And he wondered, you know, I wonder if there's any other students in here that want coffee, but they're not going to get it because they'll have to drink it out of a plastic cup. His survey was to figure out whether or not people wanted the best things out of life. And he already knew that was true. But he wanted to prove it to his students. And he told them, I brought these glasses in here to show you that people want the best things out of life. But here's what he said to his students. He said, life is the coffee and the things of life are the cups. Your job, your house, your car, and people want the best things. But he said, the coffee never changed. Life was the same. Whether you had a multi-million dollar home or whether you had just a regular home, Life is still the same. <laughs> and when you think about it overall, that, it, that's true. Now, what's most important? What's in the cup or the cup? You see, in life, we've got to realize that we've got to put up a fight to live and to live life to the fullest. And the only way to do that is to do it with God. You know, Paul said, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession among many witnesses. That's what life is about. Fighting the good fight of faith. Having eternal life. In 2 Timothy, 2, uh, 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, the apostle Paul said, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. What made him ready? He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. And I want to tell you today, a man that has not fought a good fight, a man that has not finished his course, a man that has not kept the faith, he has not lived the life that God wants him to live. Today, we've got to fight, friend. That's my point in this whole lesson today. We cannot just roll over and let the devil walk all over us. We've got to put up a fight. Number four, I like this last point. This soldier realizes, lastly, not only his concentration, not, not only uh, his confrontation and his complication, but he notices his companion, that God is fighting with him. You know, I'm reminded that God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, Fear not, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm reminded of Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 when God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
You see, this man realizes that God is fighting with him. He has a companion. And that's why in your text, if you look there in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 6, now he goes through all the Christian armor, you know, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He, he mentions all of these things. And in verse 18, notice what he said. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit for all saints. He said, pray. <laughs> pray that God will help you in your fight. Friend, I want to ask you today, are you fighting with God today? Are you fighting with God's army? God needs you, and you need God. And I'm pleading with you now to, to make a decision and say, I'm going to be a good soldier. I'm not just going to be a, a person who sits on the sideline anymore. But I'm going to serve in God's kingdom, and I'm going to train to be the person that God wants me to be. There was a boy whose family took him on a journey to visit several other countries in the world. And they wanted to show him how that because he was an American, he was very wealthy as compared to many nations in the world. So they, they took him to different places and he stayed in different villages. And when they got home, the dad asked him, he said, did you notice anything different about the people where we visited these places? The dad was wanting them to say, oh yeah, I realized they were dirt poor. <laughs> But that's not what the boy said. The boy said, you know, I did. I realized that we only have one dog, and they usually have a whole bunch of dogs. The boy said, we have a swimming pool, but they have a lake. The boy said, we come home and turn on our lights, but at night they sleep outside and look at the stars. He said, Dad... Thank you for showing me how poor we really are. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, the people who live without God are the poorest. It doesn't matter whether or not I have $100,000 in my savings account. It doesn't matter if I've got $700,000 in my 401k. <laughs> All that will be gone. What matters is whether or not I fought a good fight, whether or not I finished my course, and whether or not I kept the faith. I beg and plead with you today that you will have a companion who will fight with you in your fight. The Bible says, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Jesus spoke a parable to his disciples to this end that they ought always to pray, Luke 18 and verse 1. And I pray that you will continue fighting in your fight today, being a good soldier for Jesus Christ by putting on these, these pieces of armor that will help you be successful in your war against the devil. But I want to ask you, have you begun your fight? You may be thinking today, I haven't even done anything. I, I don't even know where to start. But I want to encourage you today to be a part of God's army. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.23 that Christ is the Savior of the body which means I've got to be in the body of Christ in order to go to heaven. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the spiritual blessings are in Christ. They're not outside of Christ. I've got to be in His body in order to experience those things. The Bible says in Acts 2, 47, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The question is, have you been added? Well, in the same chapter of Acts 2 and verse 38, he told them how to enter that body. He told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41, they gladly received his word, they were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You see, they had to be added to the body of Christ, to God's army. Jesus said about His church, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The question is, are you a part of the church of the Bible, or have you been in something that is man-made? I pray that you will search the truth and be added to God's army. May God bless you. Until next time.